Welcome everyone to our very first Q&A panel discussion for 2022 and our first ever online. We thought that in these COVID times that we'd let you stay at home and we too would socially distance for our discussion. This evening's discussion is titled, Why are the future rock stars of research at risk of disappearing? The future rock stars of research are the early to mid-career researchers. They are our young scientists finishing their PhD or in postdoctoral research positions or the early phases of their careers. Many a lab head has said that early to mid-career researchers are the engine room of laboratories. Typically, each has had 10 to 15 years intensive post-secondary education and training, averaging an investment of $500,000. Many are dependent on their ability to secure research income from the major grant funding bodies, such as the National Health and Medical Research Council, the NHMRC, and the Australian Research Council, the ARC. Success is difficult. For example, in 2021, Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt announced 248 researchers nationally would share $239 million in NHMRC Ideas grants, spanning five years. More than 2,600 applicants across Australia were unsuccessful. So what that means is that less than 10%, less than 1 in 10, received a grant. Without funding, they often have no choice but to leave their careers in science. Their years of study, their innovative idea is lost to science and lost to all of us. Today, I have three EMCRs here from the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research. Dr. Olivier Clement, who is the inaugural Safe Harbour Fellow. That's a Perkins program enabling supporters to fund a researcher for three years. Olivier works in the Genome Biology and Genetics Laboratory. We also have Dr. Liz Johnson, who works in molecular endocrinology and pharmacology, and Nick Bapu, who has was just about to or has just, Nick, passed or sub pressed submit uh, on your PhD, which is it, Nick? A couple of weeks away from pressing send. A couple of weeks away from pressing send. Good luck with that. Nick is in the Perkins Vascular Engineering Lab, the VASP Lab, which is one of our bioengineering laboratories. Also with us is Dr. Gina Ravenscroft, who has successfully navigated the challenges of being an EMCR. She's now head of the Rare Diseases Genetics Group and a strong advocate for up-and-coming researchers, which is why we've invited Gina tonight. But let me start with you, Olivier. Is it as hard as I've just summarised? Yeah, it is. Uh, I think it's a really, uh, really exciting job, but it's also highly challenging, especially, I think, at the early to mid-career stage. You're several years post your PhD. Um, can you just briefly say where you're up to in your career? Uh, sure. So I, um, I obtained my PhD in uh, 2011 uh, in France. And since then, I've been working as a postdoctoral researcher, meaning that I've been working um, in already established labs on already uh, developed projects. So I've been doing three postdocs so far, one in France and two since I moved to, um, to the Harry Perkins. And recently I was awarded, so the inaugural uh, Perkins Safe Harbor Fellowship that will secure my position here at the Perkins for the next three years. And the aim is to try to help early and carry researchers to establish a more independent position and try to do their own research. How does that um, Safe Harbour Fellowship compare um, in, in its funding support to, say, an NHMRC grant? So it's actually really similar or exactly the same. So it's not given by the government, but it's funded completely by Perkins. It will cover my salary for the upcoming three years. And it will also cover the cost, by, um, the cost of my experiments. Uh, up to $50,000 per year. So it's a really great opportunity that should allow me to develop again the project I'm, I've been developing and I'm most interested in. Yeah, actually, and can we briefly hear from you what you are working on? Yes, um, so I'm working in the field of neuroscience. I'm trying to understand how the brain develops and how the brain can function to support our daily life. Um, the subject I'm more interested in is the, I'm trying to understand how the brain can store memories. So briefly, 
memories are stored in what we call engram cells. So they are just normal cells of the brain that will kind of catch the memory that is uh, created at a given time. And I'm trying to understand the dynamics of gene expression and the control mechanisms that are responsible, that are happening in engram cells during memory uh, encoding, memory storage, and memory recollection. So trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that um, underlie memory processes in the brain. Um, assuming that would have some relevance in the future, hopefully, for a disease like Alzheimer's? Uh, yes, completely. So at the moment, I'm mostly interested in, in the, I would say, the basic part of the research, trying to understand how the brain works and how the memory can be stored for short term or for long term. Um, but of course, if you understand how memory can be stored, then you can start understanding what is going wrong in memory-related disorders. That could be Alzheimer's disease, could be Parkinson's disease, could be autism spectrum disorders. There are so many disorders uh, or pathology that are associated with memory impairments um, that uh, if we understand how what is going wrong, then we can start building on it and trying to find some new diagnostic or therapeutic um, strategies. Hmm. Now, Liz, um, you're a pharmacologist working in general pharmacology, um, particularly on proteins, which I understand enables you to work on things like um, ways to target diseases such as chronic kidney disease. Yet your research life is supplemented by teaching. So how has that come about and, and why... Why have you sort of added teaching to your research load? Yeah, I guess I've um, taken on this new uh, uh, teaching position because it, it gives me a level of job security, which is very hard to find otherwise when um, you're a completely research-based scientist. So um, having a permanent role as a lecturer at the university means that I no longer have to you look for grant funding to provide for my salary. So I still need to look for grant funding to um, cover project costs and any staff that are within our group, but it gives me the job security that I can, um, um, so that that's one less um, grant that we need to look for every year. Yeah. Um, you were telling me that your interest in science started from a young age, both your parents were scientists, and but both had medical issues themselves. And, and that sort of really put you on the track to study science. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I grew up with science around the, the dining room table with both my parents being medical scientists as well. Although I didn't actually expect to be a scientist myself. But yeah, when I was sort of late teens, um, early 20s, both of them became quite unwell. And so seeing the medical system up close really inspired me to want to understand the human body and health and disease a lot more. And also, if possible, you know, try and do my little part to, to help, um, help people with um, diseases. And probably to translate in your mind what your parents were, were going through, I imagine. Tell me, what do you see as one of the main challenges that early to mid-career researchers face? What, what's your observation of this world? I think that number one um, is job security, um, particularly when we get to this point in our career where we have, many of us have young families, we might have mortgages and trying to live year to year to, to apply for grants to get your to get a salary is extremely stressful and I see many many um, young researchers leaving the field because it's it's just not a um, long-term way to really to, to survive with, with a young family so I think job security is the number one issue mm, and, and it's not a nine to five job either no, not at all. We, most of us, I think, um, are quite used to working very long hours in the evenings and also weekends. So, um, yeah, it can be very hard in that way as well. Yeah, because I understand both you and Olivia have young children, so it's a lot a lot to juggle. Um, Nick, you too wanted to make a difference for people's health, having grown up in Mauritius and seeing that people didn't actually have the sort of access to the good health care that we enjoy here in Australia. Um, one, tell me a little bit about that, but then can you also briefly describe the topic of your PhD, which we understand is two ways, two weeks away from being submitted? Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Miriam. Um, yeah, I grew up in Mauritius and stayed there for uh, the first 15 years of my life and 
as you described, uh, there was a big problem with access and, you know, the equity that comes with healthcare. Um, so at a very young age, just like it was described, I got exposed to that um, lack of equity uh, and access to, to technologies, to new treatments, uh, and saw very close people in my life uh, suffer for that reason. And uh, in many cases, um, it ended in the inevitable. Um, like I've always, okay, similar to everyone else, also been very passionate about science and engineering and um for a number of years, I was wondering what I wanted to do, and I thought that um, my why really was to be uh, to make a, an impact in healthcare through medicine. Um, but I was incredibly lucky uh, in my undergraduate degree um, about seven years ago now. Uh, met my current PhD supervisor, Dr. Barry Doyle, and also a couple of other mentors, such as Professor Kevin Flagard, the Perkins. Um, and that really challenged me to think outside the box. Um, I was doing engineering at the time, mechanical engineering to be specific, uh, and also pathology. Uh, and they proposed that I combine the two. Um, and that's really where the engineering piece fits in my PhD, uh, which is often a concept people find hard to understand, like how does an engineer do medical research? So in simple terms, my PhD is very similar to what oil and gas engineers do. Like I think most Western Australians understand how oil and gas works, such a big part of our economy. Um, like we're using the same principles to look at, instead of looking at uh, oil and gas flow, flowing through pipes, we look at blood flowing through pipes. The pipes I'm specifically uh, interested in from my PhD is uh, are the blood vessels that run the placenta when a baby is developing um, over nine months. Um, and what my PhD is really focused at is to use engineering tools to better understand why babies um, become deprived of oxygen uh, throughout that period of, um, of pregnancy. So, um, as I mentioned before, a few weeks from submitting that, and um, the, the core of the PhD so far has really been the, the basic, basic science understanding of where things go wrong with those pipes and how that then uh, has an impact on the baby. Absolutely fascinating. I know I've heard your lab talk about really understanding blood flow and pressure, which is very like the, you know, the deep sea oil and gas pipes that we have. Um, we're going to come back to Nick because he's also doing some interesting startups, but I just want to move on to Gina. We've just heard briefly from Olivia, Liz and Nick where they're up to. How would you summarise the typical challenges young scientists face in their career stages? What have you seen? I think they've all summed it up really well. We're all really passionate about what we do and, and do it because we want to make a difference and understand how our bodies work and, and what goes wrong in disease and how we might be able to treat them. Um, I think the major challenges are the lack of job security, but also the field in Australia is just incredibly competitive. So because we don't have enough investment in the sector, the grants are getting more and more difficult to come by. And so this hyper-competitiveness um, means that people are missing out. People who overseas would easily get funded and get supported are missing out on funding here. And I don't think that people necessarily realise that without these grants, we actually don't have a job. So it's not like we just, we can't do that experiment we're really excited about. We actually don't have a position. We can't pay our mortgages. We don't have a job to go to. So, so that's really critical. And, and the other thing is that with this competitiveness, the age at which people are getting their first NHMRC, the major funding body in Australia that funds medical research, the age at which they're getting their first independent grant to fund a project is getting uh, higher and higher. So it used to be late 20s, early 30s, and I think it's now mid 40s. And mm. so people are coming out of their PhDs mid 20s, and there's sort of this 20 year gap. If you're even lucky enough to be one of those people who in their mid 40s, are, you know, can pick up their first grant. And so I think it's, it's a really tricky time and they sort of it's been referred to as the valley of death not not to sound too negative but it but it really is that there's this big void in terms of funding and and it's really hard to stay stay in the game if you look at a graph in australia over the past 40 years what's been the trend yeah so when i started out um you know, as a student, I was quite involved in when I was an undergraduate student in the departments and I'd heard, hear people talking about the funding situation and it was sort of sitting at 30, 35% in the early 2000s and it's now dropped to under 10%. 
And, you know, when it was sitting at 30, 35%, the academics were saying this can't get any worse than this. This is a crazy year that, you know, it's dropped to 30%. And we're now sitting at less than 10%. And so all that time of all of us writing these grants rather than doing the research and reviewing all the grants instead of doing the research is just an incredible waste of everyone's time and taxpayers' money because we could be getting on with the really important job of solving the question, you know, the questions we were trying to ask during our research. Do you know how much of the federal government uh, budget is is dedicated to med- medical research at the moment? So at the moment, between the NHMRC, which is the sort of traditional major funding body for medical research, and the MRFF, which is the Medical Research Future Fund, which is this very flashy thing that the health minister likes to um, talk about, those two things together are 0.7% of the health budget. And uh, peak bodies and economists believe that it should be closer to 3%. So even with the MRFF, with, you know, we need four times the budget, basically, to have a competitive and vibrant sector in Australia. Interestingly, you're, you're now recognised as a, a leading geneticist. You've won many national awards. Um, and you connect with geneticists around the world, which is why I'm really interested to hear you talk about what the situation is in Australia, because I know you talk with, with your colleagues around the world quite regularly. And, and let's just digress for a minute and talk about what you do do, which is that you're often contacted by families around the world desperate to have the genetic mutation identified that's affected their baby. Um, And I imagine that must be a very powerful experience, being able to identify a specific disease gene for a family. Yes, I think, you know, um, the work that we do is really rewarding and really important for those families. So these families have often have really sick kids and they are desperate to know what is wrong with their child and to know what the risk of recurrence might be. So until you find the genetic cause of disease, you can't tell a family what the chances are that they'll have another affected child. And so this genetic information is really, really important for those families. And knowing that we're making a difference is I guess what keeps me going, even when it's really tough, keeps me working at 11 o'clock at night because we want to find answers for those families. So, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. It is, as Olivia said, an amazing career. And, you know, I love going to work every single day to the point where when I go on holidays, I get FOMO. And I don't think there's many people that can say that about their their jobs. So while there are lots of challenges, there are also, you know, amazing opportunities and benefits from the work that we do. But, you know, nothing nothing comes close, I don't think, to getting a card saying, here's our, our new baby daughter or son, and it was only possible because of the work that you did in Perth. You know, by identifying the genetic cause of disease, that couple could then um, go on to have a, a child free from the disease in their family, and that that is very special. Yeah, also special is um, you uh, receive grant from or yes grant funding. I suppose support from the the generous philanthropist, the Kalis family, who mm-hmm. really were um, honouring the work of Patricia, the late Patricia Kalis, and, and that Patricia Kalis Fellowship in Rare Genetic Diseases. If you hadn't received that, would you actually have stepped away from your profession, do you think? Yeah, so a few years ago, I applied for a teaching position, a, a joint teaching position, teaching research position, a bit, a bit like the one that Liz has taken up. And it came very close to me walking away from that, from a, a pure research position. Um, and it was really only knowing that I had that security, a bit like Olivia, I suppose, with a safe harbour, having that security to know that someone's got your back for the next couple of years. And, you know, I'm going to still be able to pay my mortgage even if I don't get that next fellowship, I think is really, has kept me where I am. Mm. Mm. Olivia, can you tell us um, by how close uh, were you in getting a recent uh, NHMRC grant because I was fascinated to learn how they actually sort of put numbers you you sit on a scale how close were you to getting that grant um, I was really close so two years in a row for the same project that I submitted to NHMRC I was 0.04 and 0.05 points below the funding cutoff 
Um, just to give an idea of how the system works, so you submit your application to NHMRC and they, they send it to a reviewer panels. And each reviewer will score your application um, for different criteria, like um, um, feasibility of the project, um, the quality of the research, the quality of the team, the um, the innovate the innovative the innovation and creativity of the project. So you have different criteria. So every reviewer will give you a, a score between one and seven for all these different criteria. And given that I was 0.04 and 0.05 points below the cutoff, I think that it means that if any of the reviewer would have scored my application, just gave me one more extra point on any of these criteria. I think it might have been enough to go above the cutoff and be funded. And it's really frustrating because you go from something like, okay, you have the grant that will cover your salary and your research costs for the next three years to nothing. Uh, hopefully there, um, the government of Western Australia is also putting some money to help people who are really close to get a bit of money to, um, keep working on your project and keep generating preliminary data. But yeah, you really go from something that could have been amazing to nothing for kind of tiny bit of a small point. <laughs> Did they say why you didn't get it? Did they give you feedback? So yes, you receive feedbacks for every different reviewers and again, for the different criteria. I think that overall, all of the reviewers agreed that the project was really interesting, uh, really innovative, and could lead, some, could lead to some great results. Of course, some people had a few criticism of you know, the feasibility or something like this, uh, but there was one criteria that came back for a few of them that was, that don't have any track record for grant success. Basically, that would have been the first grant that I would have been awarded. Um, so that's frustrating because if they don't give me the opportunity to get it once, then how can I prove Oh, how can I expand my track record for grants? You see what I mean? So I think that this is also why this Harry Perkins uh, Safe Harbor Fellowship is good because it also shows my uh, competitiveness at the local level. So I think it also helped me, or it will help me hopefully at the national scale to get some, uh, some of, one of these grants. Mm, it's a little catch-22, um, isn't it? Um, I been, when you, sorry, Gina, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I was wanted to add something and just say that you know, Olivia would have scored a six probably out of seven. And seven and sixes are, I can't remember which way around it is, but exceptional and outstanding research. And anything over a four is very good science that should be funded. And so, you know, that tiny difference is still, we're, we're talking about, you know, margins of error when you're trying to compare outstanding research. And, it, you know, it's really the difference between the person that got funded and the score Olivia got is inconsequential, really, when, when you're so close to the cutoff. It's sort of arbitrary. Yeah, Just and of course, very year to year or grant round to grant round the number of applications. So, yeah. Um, Liz, when you did um, finish your PhD, can you tell us a little bit about how important it is to find a lab that can employ you, a lab with money working in the area that you're uh, skilled in? Well, I guess that's the uh, first thing that a PhD student needs to think about as they're finalising their thesis is what are they going to do next? So um, they do. You, you need to find a lab that will be able to employ you. And I was lucky enough um, that there was a position going in the laboratory that I did my PhD in so I could continue on in the same lab. And, and that's where I still am now all these years later. So I've been very fortunate through my career to have had um, consistent funding through my supervisor. It's been six years now since um, I finished my PhD. So um, that's a very lucky position. Many, many postdocs don't have that opportunity. And um, so I guess a lot of them um, have to look outside Australia perhaps for postdoc positions. And that's often a, a, a good opportunity um, for them to go elsewhere. And I imagine... Um grant funding sort of goes in cycles, in rounds. So a grant might be for three years or I'm not quite sure one, you, you have to tell me. Um, but I'm also imagining that 
the area of research isn't necessarily, I mean, the, the two could be misaligned. The area of research may well go on for a much longer period of time than the grant is. So how does how, how do you get around those challenges of timing? Yes, of course. Yes. So grants do often go for, say, three or four or five years, and often the project will continue on, or usually it does continue on for longer than that. So if a project loses funding after three or five years or whatever it might be, then there's the potential that it, the, the project itself may come to a standstill. And then there's a lot of wasted time and effort that it, that's gone into all of that work um, if, if the project can't continue. And so that's a great loss to, to science when that happens. Nick, um, obviously commercialising a discovery uh, is really uh, a pinnacle. Uh, because then the likelihood is that it's really going to be able to translate into helping patients. You're involved in two startup companies, um, one to improve the success of catheters, which of course are the most commonly used device in hospital, but surprisingly have a high rate of failure, and the other to enable real-time monitoring of the health of babies as they come through the birth canal. Can you tell us briefly about these two because they're quite fascinating as a bioengineer what uh, you know what's your input to both of those and, and where are those two startups up to absolutely yeah so um i guess early on in my phd i, I realized a lot of those challenges that have been discussed tonight and you know obviously you can't really uh, bet on having necessarily having a position locked in for you at the end of your phd and again with uh, incredible mentorship i was encouraged to do a few courses and uh, got involved in commercialization and um, particularly through those two startups, Veintech, uh, which is solving the catheter problem and Vital Trace, which are uh, basically developing a, a new sensor to monitor how babies are going as they're uh, coming out. Um, Veintech uh, was a company that came out of a Perth Biodesign program, a uh, program that's supported by uh, the Perkins. And uh, we identified uh, the problem uh, by having a doctor on board from day one. So rather than, you know, sort of doing research and um, uh, like we, we basically heard the problem from the, the end user, the, the doctor. Um, over two years, we were fairly lucky to get uh, one or two grants um, and also some investment, which is, I guess, another another way of thinking about how you can get your, uh, your funding. Um, but it does involve, I suppose, like really being able to pitch that business case, as you said, like not necessarily how awesome the research and the discovery is, but also that, um, that translation side of things. So we've uh, done a fair bit of work over the last two years and we're currently raising um, some seed investment uh, to really take it to the next level. And a part of that will fund uh, my own salary as I submit my PhD. And I guess uh, I probably could have submitted my PhD about three months ago, but um, in uh, the, the later stages and uh, of the PhD, um, combined with like fundraising, you, you tend to have like delays and um, as everyone's described, you, you kind of have to hit pause on like uh, trying to do the research and trying to do the commercialization just because you're fighting to find your next source of funding. Um, so that's where Vantech is at. We're getting ready for some first clinical studies uh, in a few months. Uh, we wanna, um, we're we're on, on track to achieving that. But again, uh, that work will need to be paused uh, until we, we secure our seed funding. Um, Vital Trace, on the other hand, are probably a year ahead of uh, Vantech. Um, again, it's a Vital Trace are commercializing a very uh, deep scientific technology that um, they've really developed from scratch, really. Uh, it's, a, it's a world first uh, biosensor that monitors some key biomarkers in the blood of, uh, of babies. Uh, and again, like really is able to show how a baby's health is um, while um, it's in, like while the mother's in labor. Um, with Vital Trace, we're approaching the stage of uh, doing uh, trials with large animals. Um, and uh, within the next year, I hope to achieve our first trial in um, human fetuses. So uh, being smart move pretty quick once you, I guess, have the funding. So they're, they're an example of like, when the funding does come through, things happen very fast. But in order to get to that stage and in a, in a world of COVID and a war happening um, over in Europe, um, you know, like it, it makes it makes things even more complicated. The grant process is already hard, like the investment process, like, I guess, like is even more complicated at the moment with um, everything happening and the stock market changing. So um, 
yeah, that's that's roughly where uh, these uh, two companies are at at the moment. So the balancing of research and commercialization of these two innovative ideas, and let me just describe my understanding of um, uh, vein tech, no, not vein tech, um, vital trace is it's like a like a, a patch or a sensor that gets placed on the baby's head as it's descending through the birth canal and gives real time uh, monitoring of the, the well-being of that baby as opposed to sort of intermittent monitoring, which used to happen in the past. So that's sort of a pretty simple summary. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So with commercialisation, my understanding is that it can take typically, you know, 10, even more years, 10 to 15 years, usually several million dollars. Do you apply for grants along the way as you're also commercialising uh, a, a product? That's right, yeah. So grants, again, are very dependent on track record, I think, as Olivier uh, mentioned before. Um, so depending on the stage you're at, you, you're eligible for a number of grants. And the more advanced you are and the closer you are to clinical studies, you'll also go for these NHMRC, uh, the, the government funded grants. Um, so it's a, and, and I guess like with some recent changes with the way we think our, about our economy, um, not just in Western Australia, but Australia generally, like people are starting to realize that there's all this amazing tech that's, uh, you know, being created, all this amazing research that's been created. Um, and there's new funds coming out, like that will help that commercialization. But um, I saw I saw a quote recently on uh, on Twitter that uh, said um, if without without science there's nothing to commercialize um, and Gina Gina said it well before like as the cuts keep happening at the you know creation stage of that that science and um, although there's you know some amazing thing ha happening in the commercialization space I'm a I'm a scientist by background I'm hoping to do a lot of this science in a company and be able to commercialize that, uh, you know, and get that out there in a slightly different way. But without the funding to do that basic research, there's nothing really to commercialize and nothing really to make an impact. Um, so I guess these grants really apply at all stages of the, um, the companies and the development and the commercialization pathway. Um, and um, yeah, like the, the early stage side of things still remains very much a problem though. Yeah, okay, thanks for that quick summary. Um, Olivier, you once said that, you know, getting the PhD was the straight part, forward part of the journey um, and perhaps the, the postdoctoral positions afterwards. How does it work if then you go to find a lab that hopefully is going to, that's funded, that's going to be doing work in your area? If you don't find that, um, and I'm trying to really speak to perhaps some of the younger students who might be listening to this. Do you then need to perhaps put on hold your passionate or brilliant idea that you want to further investigate and actually, um, you know, do work in a lab on the work that they need done purely because it's a funded lab and you get experience and track record? Is that a pathway that happens? Yeah, exactly. So... When you uh, submit and you are awarded your PhD, usually you don't have a um, um, good track record enough to apply for some grants, uh, got them and be more independent and run your own research project with your own uh, ideas. So usually uh, for a lot of people, a lot of researchers, what happens is that you apply to some position that have been advertised by already established labs who have their lab, have their fundings, have their ongoing research projects. And so most of the time you would work on this research project. So you always try to find something that you are interested in and that uh, your supervisor is already interested in. But if you want to do something that is a bit different or something that you really like, or um, it might be a bit more difficult because you have, if you have your own ID, maybe it's not the ID that your supervisor has, or it's not the I, it's not, one of the research that your supervisor wants to pursue. In my case, I was uh, lucky that uh, so Ryan Lister, who, uh, who is running the lab I'm in at the moment, um, I was lucky that he had enough funding and support to help me develop my own research project. Uh, so that was really good. I could really start working on that, start on this uh, project to understand memory mechanisms, even if it's something that wasn't developed in the lab uh, before I joined. And that was, uh, yeah, that was, I was really happy with that and really lucky. 
But otherwise, yeah, you have to go in research labs uh, who have already funded projects, uh, work on this to uh, improve your track record, get some publication, so that then you can apply to some fundings, get them to develop your own uh, your own projects. So, yeah. Yeah, track record, track record, and track record. Um, I'm starting to get some lovely questions coming in from our audience. Thank you very much for that. And Olivia, there's one actually that follows on from what you're saying there, which is really, what is the best piece of advice that you would give to a prospective PhD student, given the um, instability uh, in the field currently? Um, I think that the most important thing is to really like what we are working on. You need to really enjoy the research project you are working on and uh, keep pushing even if it doesn't work. So why do you need to like it? Because research, whether it's during your PhD or later in postdoc, there will always be up and downs. And so you need to like your project enough so that when it's you're on the downside, you are still motivated, still keen, and you can come back to the lab and fight again and fight and fight again until it works. Because sometimes it won't work for quite some time. So you need to be resilient and motivated. And I think that working on the project you like really helps to, you know, as Liz said, coming during the weekends, coming during the nights and all of this. So that's what I would recommend. And, mm -hmm. and work and get some data. That's the only thing that matters. Again, we are talking about track records. I think that at the end, the only thing that matters are the publications. If you have good publication, you can keep working, you can get some grants, you can keep working in this field. If the public publications are not good enough, sooner or later, you will have to quit research, unfortunately. Gina, um, really following off the back of that, you were talking a little bit earlier about the type of research you do, which is called translational research or research aimed at directly benefiting people. Um, is that also another piece of advice you would give to uh, a young student coming through that actually they focus their research on translational research as opposed to fundamental science? Or is there a cost to society if we have that um, sort of uh, swing toward translational and perhaps away from fundamental science? What do you think? Yeah, so as a, as a scientist, I think fundamental discovery science is, is incredibly important and, you know, major aspects of our response to COVID have come from support and, and people working in fundamental science. And so we can't just focus on translation. I suppose from my point of view, I have been somewhat practical in that I chose, you know, I really love what I do, but I love the work I did during my honours project as well. And I could see that that wasn't going to be something that was going to be easy to be funded. And so when I came across the work that Nigel Lang was doing in human genetics, I could see that, you know, I was really excited by that work, but also I could see because of that immediate impact for families and that translational aspect that there was probably a bit more longevity in that, in that field. I think if you want to do fundamental research, you really have to pick an outstanding lab, someone who's a world leader, and you have to go and work with the best person in the world that's doing that work because to get funding currently for fundamental research is really tough unless you are really working with, you know, the best and brightest. And I suppose that's one of the advantages of the institutes is that there's sort of this concentration of people that are really doing excellent research. And so, um, you know, the research institutes get a lot more of the grant funding because we are all research focused. Our time isn't diluted with other roles within the university. And so, you know, much of the very good, the best research in Australia happens within the research institutes here, but also um, across the country. And so, of course, from fundamental science, you know, major discoveries often come through serendipity. Yeah, I mean, the, the discovery of the enzyme we, we now use in all of the PCRs for the COVID test was discovered because a scientist many years ago was really fascinated with what could survive in hot springs. And he got money to go and collect water samples from the hot springs and, and that's how they isolated the enzyme we use for PCR, he would not, um, with today's climate, get a grant to do that sort of science. And, and so that is what we're at risk of losing. Those types of massive, you know, shifts in how we do our research will be lost if we don't support the, the early stages of, of research, that really discovery 
blue sky I mean, science. This pandemic, you couldn't ask for a more visible argument for investing in science than, than with COVID. And while the development of the vaccine was considered fast, of course, the science behind it had happened over about 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So has there been around the world, are some countries now following uh, post-COVID, if we can call it that, renewed investment in, in some countries in medical research? Does anyone know the answer to that? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the US and EU have all increased their budgets by 20% at least. Or, uh, Portugal's doubled its budget. Austria's increased its budget really heavily to try and, um, you know, really boost the sector and improve funding for, for research in other parts of the world. And it, it's really disappointing that it hasn't happened here. Yeah. Now, I am getting lots of questions through, which is great. So please keep them coming. I'm just going to refer to some. There's, and uh, any of our panellists jump in because I'm not quite sure who to direct this to. Is there a country that has really nailed the research pathway, especially supporting their EMRCs to CRs to um, achieve success and future-proof their careers? And what are they doing differently? Does anyone know across the world a country who's doing it well? I think it's probably a little bit the same everywhere. There is the bottleneck between the, the early and mid career researcher. Whether you are in Australia, in Europe, or even in the US, there are always some grants. It's the same for early career researchers to try to establish and be more independent. But I think it's always the same. It's always highly competitive. And you can see on Twitter that so many labs in Australia, in the US, in Europe, um, some labs have to shut down because of lack of funding, and some people who may have been established for three, four, five years have, at some point, because of lack of funding, closed their lab and fired the people who were working for them. So I think it's a tough time, but also because it's a political issue where people do not see the immediate benefits of funding research, and this is why the money is going down, and uh, this is why a lot of people have to leave research at some point, I think. Yeah, actually, Olivia, you lead into a really good point, which is about the communication of science. And there's a question here, um, is research, uh, is it more than just doing good research? Is it about being able to sell your work to grant bodies? And I was going to add the extra level of, is it also about being able to communicate to the wider community so that there's a, a real level of um, awareness of what science is doing but let's start with the first one how much is it just about presenting a good application in a grant and how much now is it about being able to sell your science to the grant um, uh, assessors i mean currently you can write an excellent grant and still not be funded so it's really not that isn't enough anymore you can have an incredibly polished grant that everyone thinks should be funded and there just simply isn't, isn't enough money. And I, I don't think it's a communication problem. A recent poll said that something like 85% of Australians thought that med investment in medical research was really important and that we should invest more in medical research. And despite that, the politicians have not increased investment in health and medical research. So I think there's a real disconnect in what the community wants and what is happening in Canberra. And I don't know why, but but it's interesting. You know, the scientists keep thinking it's a you know a no brainer and an election winner if you know some party came out and said they'd double the budget, but but it's not happening. And, and the other thing is that for every dollar invested, there's a three to four dollar return on that investment. So you've got to spend the money to make the money, and we need to diversify our economy. And so, you know, it really is a no brainer that if if we need someone with vision. We need some leaders with some vision who can see the long-term benefits and see beyond the three-year, four-year election cycle. And I think that's one of the major issues in Australia with, with where we're at at the moment. Mm. Now, I've got a lovely comment in here from Donna, um, sort of mentioning that each of you have um, referred to uh, mentors or people who have provided you some guidance in your pathway and she would really love a little bit more um, elaboration on this so I will go through briefly the four of you um, and let's start with you Liz 
you talked at the beginning of how your parents' illness, but also being scientists, sort of started you on the pathway. What about going through further? Um, have there been one person or people who have really given you um, more encouragement, sense of direction, guidance, any, any mentoring that has made a difference to you? Yes, well, I, I, I briefly mentioned before my PhD supervisor, who was also my honour supervisor, Kevin Flager, and he has been a very supportive mentor throughout my entire career. Um, he's supported me, obviously, financially now as a postdoc, although not now with my current, current role, but he also has guided me through the alternative pathways that scientists can take. He has a very... Um, uh, a, perhaps a less conventional um, pathway in science. Um, Nick briefly mentioned him before as well. Um, he um, has had several spin-out companies and he's really gone down the commercialisation path of science. So having that guidance has really um, shown me the different ways that you can be able to do science successfully in Australia, particularly in this very difficult climate. So, so. Kevin um, has really consistently supported me throughout my career, so he's been my number one mentor. What about you, Nick? Yeah, I guess without without mentors, I wouldn't be on this panel tonight probably and wouldn't really have as many insights to share. Um, I guess uh, I, I was quite lucky, I suppose, also meeting Kevin quite early on in my PhD and, you know, really being able to think outside the box. But um, my PhD supervisors, are, you know, core scientists by heart so um, really understanding these challenges and like uh, really being able to future proof my own career um, all that advice came from mentors from from day one um, and I guess being part of the Perkins as well has uh, Olivia briefly touched on really finding what you like to do and like you know really finding that why um, being at Perkins is you know when you start just start your PhD is the coolest thing in the world because you're surrounded by you know people like Gina and Olivia and Liz like uh, doing amazing things um it's a it's a community really at the end of the day like and you know it's uh I guess for me as well personally like I, I uh, started my PhD at the Perkins around the time where uh, the engineering groups transitioned from the, the UWA the very old UWA buildings to you know being in a medical institute doing what what we do research based at right next to a hospital. Um, so I guess like, uh, but connection to the institution that brings a connection to the problem and a connection to the community as well. Uh, and the amazing research uh, and amazing people we've got at the Perkins is uh, a great way, uh, but all of us really keep going. Um, certainly have missed uh, coming in uh, with the restrictions recently and particularly in these last stages of the PhD, but um, yeah, like, some of my best memories over the last couple of years, both professionally and uh, with many friends and colleagues that are, will stay as uh, you know lifelong colleagues really now, uh, been at the Perkins. You know, when um, you look at publications, the list of authors is really long typically and from all over the world. I mean, not only does the Perkins have a league of nations of people working in it, but each of your research papers, I see them when they're published because we display them on the walls. There's people from all over the world. Has COVID and this real shift to connecting virtually um, cemented further close relationships, do you think, between research uh, groups and institutes around the world? Um, yeah, I can briefly comment on that. Um, I... Uh, I was quite lucky in early days of my PhD to actually go overseas and meet collaborators uh, for one project and attend conferences and things. Um, I think initially COVID definitely had an impact on that because no one knew how to adapt in early days. But um, over the last year and a half, at least, like with uh, platforms like Twitter and, you know, just, just our ability to adapt to virtual platforms, um, that's definitely strengthen uh, that connection with international collaborators and um, you know being able to follow what your peers are doing and you know often we we talk about those problems that everyone faces in funding and, um, it's it's common every, everywhere around the world and everyone works together um, 
and sort of uh, yeah wind juice together sometimes. Uh, but yeah, um, certainly, certainly uh, with technology and that, uh, yeah, like we've uh, definitely gotten closer. Mm. Kit asks a really important question, talking saying that people living with various conditions and diseases are also experts by experience, which is absolutely true, and that they're navigating their unique lived. Uh, experience of the disease and asks does Perkins researchers work directly with patients um, experiencing uh, diseases to help advance research and prevention now I certainly know that the the cancer laboratories the researchers in the cancer laboratories do in fact it's often a requirement of their grant applications to have what's called a, a research buddy which is a um, uh, a member of the public with lived experience reviewing their grants. For any of you, does that um, is that now a requirement or is that part of your work as well? And I'm sorry I can't direct specifically yeah. to each of you because I'm not quite sure who's going to answer this. I, I can answer that. So, I mean, our research by definition is really closely linked to patients and families and we've been very lucky over the years to... Um, have interacted with a number of those families and some of them go on to to support us as well which is you know amazing um, and recently we've sort of um, formalized some of those informal um, associations with with patient groups and with families and formed a consumer reference group and so we have individuals from Perth and from Sydney and from Melbourne that have either have a condition themselves or have had a child with one of the conditions that we work on. And so we work very closely with that, with that consumer reference group. And, and I agree that, especially in the rare diseases space, often the person that best knows the condition is that patient rather than their specialists, because they may have never seen that disease before. Whereas those patients live with that disease and connect with patients around the world with that incredibly rare disease. And so we'll be experts on their condition more than perhaps the medical specialists with which they engage. Now, I suppose that's also where Facebook social media has potentially linked patients with similar rare diseases. Do you find that, that you need a cluster and that cluster might be from five different countries for a rare disease? Yeah, that happens all the time. And as, you know, the genes get found and the diseases get a name, new support groups form on, you know, platforms like Facebook and they'll share experiences and say, you know, we want to fly to Disneyland. How did other people with this condition and all these, this equipment that we need to take with us do it? And, and really simple, practical things get shared. And, and so they can navigate those journeys together and laugh with each other and cry with each other and, and all learn from each other because, they know better than anyone else what it's like to, to live with those diseases. Uh, I have a question here from Leon, um, who is clearly well informed, just saying that looking at the NH and MRC funding rates for competitive grants in 2021, WA received the lowest of all states, 8.3%. Um, he says, correct me if otherwise, but funding rates for medical research in WA appear to be lower than other states. Does anyone have any knowledge of whether there are particular reasons for that? Yeah, so I think Lane has probably been overly generous and I think the success rates for WA are about 2.5 to 5%, not 8%. We would be very happy if they were sitting about 8% because that would be much closer to what our percentage of the population is. Um, I think part of it is that there's what they call the tyranny of distance. So we don't connect as much with our colleagues over East. And those are the people sitting on the panels and making the decisions about their peers. That for us to go and sit on a panel or go to a conference is sort of a three-day exercise. Whereas for people from Melbourne or Sydney, they can do it in a day and be home for dinner type thing. So it, there's, you know, barriers to us participating and we have to, get better at making ourselves seen and heard over on the East Coast uh, where decisions are made. Um, and I also think part of it is that the state government here hasn't invested in medical research like many of the other states have. So Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales have all invested heavily. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in health and medical research in recent years. And we just haven't seen that investment in WA, despite all of the resources we pull out of the ground here. And so I think the declining success rates is, is in part driven by 
um, the lack of local support. And so we don't have those other grants to rely on to build up our teams and keep us going. And because it's so much more competitive here than other places in Australia, researchers from WA leave and they go to Melbourne or Sydney and they get their grants there. And so some of us keep a tally of the researchers that were here that have gone somewhere else that have managed to get their grants. Um, that's sort of, yeah, a, a, yeah, book of secrets of all the people we let we lost that we let go. And what could we be doing here if we managed to keep those five or six research leaders here and didn't lose them? And work hard to do on that. Will you want to say something, Nick? Yeah, I was just going to say, I was just going to comment that this is exactly the same in the commercialization world, uh, but that, that tyranny of distance still applies. And I've got many, many peers and uh, founders of other companies that have just fully moved to Melbourne now um, and just to have access to, you know, institutions and um, companies that make the, the key decisions uh, for um, various types of investments and things. So, um, yeah, certainly a huge pro problem across the board. I have another question. Yeah. Do you think sorry, oh, sorry, Olivia, do you want to jump No, sorry, on? sorry. Yeah, I just want to say that a bit earlier we were chatting about what is important uh, to succeed and that track record is the number one thing that has to be uh, focused on for early career researchers. But I think that networking is also important because if people, you know, as uh, Gina was saying, that on the East Coast know us, then it's easier for us to be funded. So I think that for... Um, yeah, PhD student or early career uh, researcher, it's also important to go on uh, on seminars and uh, conferences to meet people and uh, and build a network that then would be useful later. Liz, have you had any um, have any insights into this area? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly since COVID, I think it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword being able to communicate with your colleagues and your collaborators so easily, which we all do now every day via Zoom or Teams or whatever. So that's a really great advantage that we have. But at the same time, with the when you go to conferences, it's not just about the talks and, um, you know, learning all the science. It's it's after the sessions when you talk with your colleagues in different labs and really learn the nitty gritty of what they're doing. And it's those kind of discussions that I think breeds really exciting science. And I think that's really been missing the past few years when you can't actually go to a conference. And even when you do these virtual networking things, it's, it's just not quite the same. And so I'm, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to my first real life conference, hopefully this year, so I can see all my friends and colleagues who I haven't seen in life, in real life for many years. And so we can really have those discussions that just don't happen otherwise. Yeah, nothing like actually face to face. We're getting close to time. There's one last question that I think is a lovely one to finish on, which is, do you think the skills you develop as research scientists are transferable to other careers it's a really pertinent question considering all the challenges we've talked about let's briefly go through each of the four of you so Liz while you're on let's start with you do you think the the skills you've learned in this career are transferable to another well absolutely I think they they are and um so, for example, to, to be a scientist, you're basically a project manager. You have to learn how to, you know, run a project. You have to budget it. You have to um, forward plan what's going to be happening in the next days, weeks, months, years even. You have to be able to lead a team of people underneath you and direct how they work and, and all of the leadership um, uh, to, uh, um, requirements that go with that so yeah these skills are absolutely transferable um, to other fields I think but most of us don't want to go to other fields we, we want to stay where we are because we love doing science um, but yes um, we, we are able to move into other areas as well. Nick you've obviously become really skilled or beginning to get more skilled in the whole area of commercialization tell me you've done some professional development courses in that? Uh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, early on in my PhD, I did the Perth Biodesign Program, which is an entrepreneurship uh, commercialization training uh, course. Um, and again, like a lot of the uh, principles that we get trained in research, like critical thinking and everything else that Liz mentioned, um, 
they're exactly the same in in that uh, in that world of commercialization and um, the core the core of commercialization as well is in order for impact to be made things need to be done at the highest level of scientific integrity and um, you know at the uh, you know in, in order to really make an impact on patients the science needs to be proven and it needs to work um, so at its core like the the way scientists think is exactly the same way it ends up working in the real world um, and yeah I, I guess just from a soft skill perspective um, the I guess like the teamwork and the management uh, that you need to do in research and writing a grant and putting your budget is exactly what you do if you were you know doing like what I'm doing right now like raising investment like that's what investors want to see like where are you going to spend the money and how am I going to get my return on investment back um, so um, it, a lot of those skills uh, yeah like it's a benefit to be a, a researcher and a scientist by background uh, like going into these other areas. Olivia, what would you say have been skills that you have developed that you would think are good and transferable? Yeah, I agree with what Liz and Nick said. Uh, I would just add that we also learn how to interact with people and how to uh, train, for example, new students, how to uh, yeah, build up deadlines, um, you know, manage projects. So all of these, I think, yeah, they answered pretty well. And I, I think it is transferable to another job. And I hope so too, in case I have to change. Uh, <laughs> I do. I hope not, but yeah, let's see. And final word with you, Gina. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we often go to workshops where they, they say, come and find out about alternative careers for scientists. And actually, I think the academic career is the alternative career because there's much fewer of us doing this than what there is doing all sorts of other, other roles. And so I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, you know, people go and work for all sorts of different companies that use these research skills and, and we mustn't forget about, you know, that there are all these opportunities and we need scientists to infiltrate all aspects of our society. We need them in law, we need them in politics, we need them in policy. And so we need to take that sort of scientific inquiry into everything we do and maybe we'd be in a different situation if 20% of our politicians had a science background. Yep, influencing policy, good communications. Look, we have come to the end of our time. I do want to thank all of our panellists for sharing details of their areas of research and for their insights into the challenges and the joys experienced in a medical research career. Um, so thank you to the four of you and thank you to everybody who has tuned in tonight to our first ever online q and I hope you thought it was a success. Uh, and I hope you really enjoyed the session. So good night.